UN um, Earth uh, structures. Mm -hmm. Do we have processing? I think so, right? Yeah, I think we got soil and health and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dang it, so I just have a whole free period between this class. <laughs> Uh, you can start it. Yeah. <laughs> we have one, one, two. So if you remember, he uh, went through a calculation for you last time, which was about some of the kind of oxidation state of our early atmosphere. And you can see how there's something like 2% of what we consider the present atmosphere of pressure would have been made up by hydrogen. And um, a significant fraction would have been water, and then you know some amount of CO, uh, carbon monoxide, and CO2. And, you know, I think we all know that our current atmosphere is much more oxidizing, and this is really because of photosynthesis. And so um, there was a transition from really reducing atmosphere to really oxidizing atmosphere. Didn't happen immediately. It happened in stages related to um, transitions with life. But also, if you think about it, you've got all these reduced materials on the surface of the Earth that came from the condensation sequence. And when we started having photosynthesis, the first thing that that oxygen went into was reducing those chemicals in the rocks, right? So it took a long time to build up in the atmosphere because it was a big reservoir of stuff dissolved in the early oceans and in the surface of the earth that needed to be oxidized. And so, um, you know, this is kind of a summary of what happened to our atmosphere. Um, you know, we condensed, we accreted, and then we lost a lot of our early proto-atmosphere. Um, there was additional degassing from the planet's interior. This is still happening now. We have gases come up associated with volcanism. Um, and then we start to see how much carbon dioxide um, is in our atmosphere kind of being stabilized by reaction with rocks, which we've already talked about before. This thing called the Urey reaction, which is mediated by having surface water but taking CO2 from the atmosphere, reacting with the rocks to make carbonate minerals is, and if you recall, when we talked about the carbon cycle, we saw that there were many tens of thousands of times more carbon stored in rocks off the surface of the earth in the exogenic carbon cycle than in the atmosphere. And this is a primary difference between us and Venus. Why Venus is so hot in part is because most of the CO2 is in the atmosphere, not stored in rocks. So this, this was important independent of life. This is what was required to help bring the temperatures down um, because CO2 is such an efficient greenhouse gas. So then we have photosynthesis, the development of oxygen and the ozone layer, which after a certain point, um, it took a couple billion years or more of photosynthesis to keep going on till we could build up enough oxygen to make an ozone layer for life to evolve out of the oceans on the land. And in the early days, there was some poisoning, recall that term before, um, by the sulfide sulfate and iron two, iron three couples. We see that in the chemistry of things that come out of, for instance, the proto-ocean, what we see in what we call paleosols, which are ancient soils. Um, and by dating those things and looking in the geologic record, we can understand when these transitions happen. They're still isolated places on the planet where we find conditions like this, for instance, a uh, deep zone of the Black Sea um, is a place uh, like that, but, but we don't find those conditions in the early oceans, or excuse me, in the open ocean. So this is kind of just a plot showing you sort of in a most gross summary, the sort of change in carbon dioxide, starting from the beginning of Earth's history to the present kind of coming down dramatically in that first half billion years, and then sort of staying low and going up and down this wiggly line just to indicate the kinds of variations that we've already talked about from climate and uh, plate tectonics, the organization of the carbon cycle, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those are small compared to that change that happened early on due to the bringing of carbon into rocks and the rise of oxygen, right? And so if nothing else, you could consider kind of two periods of time for our atmosphere. There's a lot more variation than that, especially early on, but this is a really critical thing that defines how our atmosphere operates today. Um, this is basically a couple of different estimates of how oxygen may have risen, just like we talked about last time with the crustal growth models. Not everyone agrees on the same kind of scenario for um, how things built up in time. So there's one model, for instance, that suggests that oxygen was a lot higher and then came back down as we move forward in time. Another one that sees it kind of 
increasing more steadily. But the, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, I would think the advent of photosynthesis happened somewhere around 3.5-ish billion years ago or so. Um, certainly definitely established by 3.2. There's lots of evidence for that. Uh, and, and yet all that oxygen for like another billion years or so wasn't building up in the atmosphere. That was because it was going in the rock. And then, you know, there was a period of time where that was happily going on. And then sometime associated with, you know, the Cambrian explosion, um, which was probably a consequence, not a cause of the rise of oxygen. That's what allowed us to develop the ozone layer and move life out um, onto, you know, onto land. And, so, and you can see that that's associated with a pretty significant change, right? So our current partial pressure of oxygen is about 0.2 um, or 20% of the total. And for a lot, a lot of Earth's history, you know, something like um, nearly four fifths of it, it was below one, right? So less than half of what we had. So just, you know, if you dream about going back and, you know, visiting the earlier bring oxygen with you. Um, and um, I have a few more slides in here to talk about, you know, how oxygen varied in time. And I'm going to kind of jump through because. Um, this is sort of leftover from last time, but you can read it. They're basically, <clears throat> some of the refinement of this comes from looking at other things in rocks that tell us about oxygen in a really sensitive way. Things that we've already talked about before, like the solubility of manganese in its oxidized and reduced forms, iron in its oxidized and reduced forms, um, the behavior of sulfur in oxidized and reduced forms, and some of this calls on isotopes, the, the um, fractionation between two different stable isotopes of sulfur as a function of what oxidation state sulfur was in to allow people to reconstruct more, more detailed curves. Um, <clears throat> there's also this kind of decrease in CO2. And so in addition to, remember, we also talked about the crust is starting to form early on, but we don't really have plate tectonics yet. We don't know when that established, but you know, many models put this at kind of like three and a half or maybe um, um, three billion years ago. By three billion years, we're pretty sure we've got regular old plate tectonics like we have today. So it's probably some period of proto time in there, perhaps stretching as far back as a billion years, um, but it wasn't really operating yet correctly. So we didn't have this kind of mountain building and especially granitic crust formation that was associated with subduction today. And, and so carbon dioxide kind of came down in steps. There were periods of time in the past with glaciation, as we've talked about before, and those represent periods of time where the carbon dioxide was being pulled down substantially by one or another thing. Uh, this is just the last 100 million years, right? And again, we've talked about that before, all the climate fluctuations and sort of human uh, aspects, um, you know, pushing CO2 are all happening down in here. So that, you know, before, um, you know, the sort of start of the paleogene, we were really coming down off a much higher value, right? And, um, and I mean, interestingly enough, we're pushing ourselves back up this curve into places that, um, you know, rightfully cause chemists and other you know, climate science and everyone else a fair amount of concern because it's way outside of the zone that we were in that represents kind of chemical equilibrium with all the conditions extant on the planet. I'm just going to make sure we're still, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so um, this is some evidence about this um, change in um, oxygen. And um, it has to do with looking at the occurrence of banded iron formation. These are iron rich deposits that form when in the oceans, when you go from oxidizing, or excuse me, reducing conditions where iron is soluble to oxidizing conditions when it isn't precipitate a lot of iron, you get iron-rich sediments, they're bright red. Um, other things um, happen as well. Um, for instance, you can see the variability in sulfur isotope composition preserved in minerals uh, in soils. And um, you can see in a couple of different, um, different proxies, lots of variation up here and then none, little variation, more variation. This indicates kind of what people talk about is the great oxidation event, which we don't really think was a single event, but sometime between two and a half and two billion years ago, there was this kind of period of time where we were transitioning from primarily more reducing to primarily more oxidizing. That was a prerequisite 
um, getting the whole hydrologic cycle as well as the crust to be oxidized to then building up ozone in the atmosphere. Couldn't do that until we did this um, because we need a certain standing crop of oxygen to be able to be reactive to make ozone. Um, and so there's a couple of other questions that we like to ask of ourselves, like, okay, we look in our atmosphere uh, today, how much of our original condensate um, made it through accretion, right? How much of what we started with in the nebula, with, in terms of all those elements at the lower part of the ferrochar, do we still have? How much of it um, was lost to space when? How has the atmosphere evolved as a consequence? <clears throat> One of the things we know is, is that for things that were in the gas form early on, at least through the moon forming event, we probably lost most of that gas. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence from the noble gases for how we know that, that um, some of the gases that we currently have in our atmosphere were locked up in rocks, in minerals, in the proto mantle to be released subsequently through the process of you know, volcanism associated with um, either protoplate tectonics or whatever earlier style of volcanism we had on the planet. That stuff subsequently degassed to make our atmosphere, and we call our current atmosphere, stage two atmosphere because of it, right? So there was some stuff that was in the gas phase. A lot of that was blown away because of the high temperature. It's a Titari phase of the sun. Uh, we find on uh, other sun stars that's a very early super luminous phase that produces a very strong solar wind. We don't know exactly when our traditional core system established its magnetic field, which also helps protect the Earth from the cosmic ray flux to some extent and provide some amount of safety for our atmosphere. So all these things are transitioning. And as you can imagine, it's hard to kind of go back in time and say exactly when there's things happened. But um, we can start at the beginning with our 90-10 model that we've used for all the other chemical elements to figure out what inventory we expect for various elements. And then we can compare it to Earth um, today in the atmosphere. This just mentions um, this Titari phase and the stage one and the stage two things. There's some interesting things that we can say, even though nitrogen, for instance, is the dominant gas in our atmosphere, that we take stock of what we have we have way less than a percent of what we would expected from accretion with respect to the condensation sequence. Most of it is gone. Um, and I think if you, if you think, again, we've already talked about the gassy planets and the outer part of the solar system from uh, Jupiter out as being more massive than we had expected because they accumulated more material to themselves because they grew relatively large, relatively early, had a big gravitational attraction. A lot of what they're attracting are um, these low atomic weight materials that have been pushed out from the inner solar system and then accreted onto those bodies. And, and so you can see that, you know, we, we think we should have had something like, I don't know, 275, 300 to 400 times as much nitrogen based on the condensation sequence. Some other things that are kind of alluded to on the next couple slides, such as the fact that xenon, which is a gas, it's one of the noble gases, the heavy, heaviest non-radioactive noble gas. Um, and one of its isotopes is produced by radioactive decay from iodine. It doesn't happen particularly fast. You know, uh, it's a almost 16 million year half-life compared to some of the other time scales we've talked about in early Earth history. It's still pretty fast. And the fact that when we look in the atmosphere today and we look at gases coming out of volcanoes today, which are telling us what's in the interior of the Earth, we find more of this iodine-produced xenon in the mantle than in the atmosphere, which means that when we very first started to lock in the rocky composition, we still had some live iodine, which then subsequently decayed to make xenon, which is only now getting out, right? So if it had gotten out earlier, then this ratio and this ratio would be the same. But the fact that this ratio is higher means that there was still some of this alive in the rocky planet when the proto-atmosphere was formed, which presumably included a lot of the xenon-132, the stable isotope, right? It didn't accrete into the interior of the Earth. And then subsequently, we have some decay of iodine-129. It produces some more xenon. And then over time, that starts to leak out so that what's in the mantle is higher than what's in um, the atmosphere. And that helps us understand the relative proportion of, for instance, the gas xenon that was held by the rocky Earth versus not. Um, we can also look at argon. 
Argon is a lighter, um, another noble gas. Argon-40 is produced by radioactive decay of potassium-40. There, there were some argon-40 before that, but there's additional argon-40 produced by potassium. And when we look at the argon coming out of the mantle, this ratio is way, way higher. The potassium-produced component of the argon, argon-40, is way enriched in the mouth compared to the atmosphere. So again, um, if when Earth had formed, all of the gaseous elements um, were stripped out immediately and put into the proto-atmosphere, what would be coming out of the mantle today would have to be only the stuff that was pushed back in by plate tectonics, not any primordial gases. And yet we think we do have some primordial gases, and there's kind of various lines of evidence for it. And so um, we can also estimate, you know, um, the difference between what we see in the atmosphere and what we see coming out of the mantle, which is like a factor of 10 differences, gives us some idea of the relative amount of argon that was partitioned between the gas envelope in the stage one atmosphere and the rocky part of the Earth. Um, you can also say, well, how much gas have we lost to space, right? Because the planet isn't big enough. So this is basically a calculation with a bunch of description. It's a, it's a statistical argument based on kinetic energies and the gravitational field of the planet, which of course was changing as we were growing and accreting. It's hard to make that calculation for um, anything other than basically 100% mass, um, but uh, you can do it. But anyway, that's what this is for. This is for sort of at the end of accretion, at the end of heavy bombardment. And these are different atomic masses of gases, right? They're either atomic weights if they're atoms or atomic uh, molecular weights if they're, if they're gases, like H2 gas or whatever. And this is the time it takes to escape for a significant fraction of that gas to escape uh, the, the atmosphere. And it's a question of sort of a combination of the energetics of the atmosphere, how hot is it out there in that outer envelope, how fast are molecules moving and how big is the gravitational attraction of the planet relative to the size of the molecule. So you can see here as molecules get heavier and heavier, it takes longer and longer in time for us to lose a significant fraction of that gas. And so you can see for Earth, which is here, right, the time that's calculated, this is the line for the age of the Earth. So the only two elements we expect to be able to escape in any appreciable amount over the amount of time we've given them is hydrogen and helium. So pretty much everything else we got, we have it. It's not going anywhere. <clears throat> if you were on Venus, we, you know, some heavier gases would come out too, for primarily because it's so much hotter. Um, on Mars, even heavier gases would leak out because Mars is much less massive than Earth, and so it doesn't have the same gravitational attraction. And you can see where the moon is. Again, that much less mass. So, and you can read through how the calculation is done here if you're interested or not. But one of the things that this does is allow us to predict ratios of, for instance, hydrogen one to hydrogen two to helium three to helium four that we expect because they're on this kind of steep part of this curve. They're all, all down in here in, in the atmosphere. There's also an important thing which I had mentioned to you before, which is, is that in the atmosphere above the tropopause, up in the stratosphere and higher, we have the tendency to break apart water molecules and hydrogen atoms and hydroxyl radicals. And those hydrogen atoms can then be lost. So having the current structure of our atmosphere, which has an ozone um, layer, which helps keep a thermal boundary for migration of gases from the troposphere up to the stratosphere, also helps us retain our water in the lower part of the atmosphere where it can't break apart and then partly be lost to space. So it's kind of an important aspect of the Earth system as well that keeps our hydrologic cycle working the way it does. Um, and then, th you know, this is just some information about some the noble gas variation. Each of them here, um, what we observe in the atmosphere versus what we expect, okay? Noble gases don't really have much chemistry in bulk. We talked about the fact that some argon is produced and some xenon is produced in the mantle by radioactive decay, but the bulk of the rare gas component that we have just comes from, you know, what, what we have, or what we initially accreted with. There's also some helium-4 that is produced on the planet from uranium or decay. But these gases, they're offset from what we expect from the solar abundances. They're low, but they're not nearly as low as these guys, right? The carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, three of the most important elements of life 
they are really depleted. Um, and part of why we think they are so depleted is, is that the, um, they are still bound up in materials in the interior, a fraction. Um, the rest of the slides here kind of go into a little bit more detail about how we transition. And I'm going to skip through them and let you read them as I kind of implied last time about the, the relationship between the development of life, the oxidizing of iron and early rocks, and the development of, of photosynthesis and so forth. I'll kind of summarize on the next few slides with some like time scale of things that we know, you know, um, like when did we first start seeing photosynthesizing plants on land? Um, you know, when did we start um, to see multicellular life? Um, paleosols that do have iron, which means soils that have iron that is now insoluble because it's oxidized, banded iron formations, this variation in sulfur isotopes that I talked about, where they sit on a timeline. Um, I put them on top of the timeline. It just shows you some of the events that happened in the development of life. So they're, they're, they're very correlated together. This is just that's like what a bit looks like. Banded iron formation, it's a polished uh, section of rock. Um, and these are stromatolites, just um, those are modern, but these, this is an early form of microbial life that we think helped promote the earliest development of photosynthesis on the planet. Um, and just a little bit more, you know, kind of information that goes along with that time scale. Um, and kind of moving forward into the present, like I say, just talks about, you don't have to memorize any of these times. I, I personally find it interesting that the geological time scale is really kind of a history of lifetime scale. And that history of lifetime scale is really kind of a history of geochemistry uh, of the earth. They go hand in hand. One and the other are required for, um, you know, together to, to see the changes that we see. But it is, there are really major changes that are associated with these different periods of time in Earth's history where the whole system is migrating. It gives you an idea uh, in composition and in biological attributes it can support. So it gives you some more um, sort of food for thought about if humans substantially change the atmosphere. We're not talking about like little tweaks, but if we substantially change the atmosphere, like changing the carbon dioxide concentration to factors of two or three, which is perhaps where we're headed, um, what does that mean for all this other stuff that over Earth history changed slowly along with it if we, if we go and push it really fast? Um, it may not be so good. Just saying. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of ending up what we were talking about last time. Do you have any questions about any of that? I know I went through it kind of quickly, but I did want to make sure I talked about it a little bit. No? Okay, so now our, our next topic, which we're going to do, I know um, it's Thanksgiving Thursday, so we're going to do this this week and next week, um, is igneous geochemistry. And then in our final week, we're going to talk about isotopes again, but we'll talk about radiogenic isotopes that go along with that. Um, and today I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview because I don't know how many of you have had igneous petrology or not. We're going to talk about some rock types. I'm going to, going to try and go through everything, but just give you some idea of some of those variations. Then we're going to focus primarily on distribution coefficients. And then next time we will use distribution coefficients and the elements that they reflect to understand something about the conditions in which melt and solids coexist in igneous systems. So both melting and crystallization, um, which generally happen in two different places, one deep in the metal and one up in the crust. And this tells us a lot about um, igneous processes. So first thing to remind you of, is that we find igneous rocks all over the planet. This is um, kind of a cartoonish depiction of the plate boundaries on the planet. And um, not all, but some number of the active volcanoes um, that have been active. Um, you know, I don't remember the time period over which this is. It says here past one million years. So, you know, volcanism associated with subduction zone. That's these things with little triangles. Uh, there's obviously volcanism associated with the ocean ridge, but they're not depicted as individual volcanoes. Uh, they're just depicted as this kind of double line. And then there's intraplate volcanism like we have here in Hawaii and various parts of the South Pacific and, and you know, in, in all the ocean basins. And there are fundamental differences between 
these types of rocks. We know that the continents um, are continental crust, as we've talked about, a much thicker crust, compositionally distinct. And so it stands to reason that volcanism in the continents, even if it originated in the mantle um, and poked through it, is going to have different compositional attributes than volcanism in the ocean basins where the crust is a lot thinner and a lot younger for the most part, uh, because magma does interact with solids as it percolates up to the, to the surface. And so these are things that we would like to be able to interrogate, for instance, to be able to ask the questions about what aspects of Hawaiian volcanism reflect the hot spot but below it versus interaction with the crust and what uh, aspects of something like Yellowstone volcanism, which is another hot spot that's intercontinental. How much of that came out of the mantle and it's telling us about the difference between those hot spots and the mantle plumes that feed them versus something that's happening subsequently in the crust. We can make the same argument about intra-oceanic arcs, places where one oceanic plate is subducting under another, such as here in Japan or down here in Tonga or um, even New Zealand to some extent, Northern New Zealand, versus places like you know, the Cascades or the Andes where that volcanism is happening through continental crust. So this is just a kind of a summary of where the volcanism happens uh, by the different kinds of plate boundaries. Okay, so constructive plate boundaries are, um, you know, uh, divergent zones, mid-ocean ridges. Destructive plate boundaries are um, subduction zones, continental interplate, oceanic interplate, these are hot spots. Um, and you can see the proportions of, you know, where most of the volcanism happens. And the relative proportion of what we call volcanic stuff that erupted at the surface, extrusive rocks, plutonic intrusive rocks, the stuff that didn't make it to the surface that cooled down below, okay? And there's a separation of chemicals um, that we will be talking about in the difference between these two things. But this proportion, you can see here that in all of these cases, there's a substantially greater amount of magma that gets into the crust and doesn't erupt, right? In this case, is a factor of six times as much stuff stays down below, slowly crystallizes into crystalline interior rocks that we call plutons, um, relative to volcanic rocks. You can see these same kind of proportions here. This is more than a factor of 10 at the high, high point. Um, again, a factor of 10 here. So just imagine when we start to talk about crystallization, especially partial crystallization, what we're really talking about is the fact that a lot of magma comes off the mantle into the crust and never erupts. And the only way we get to see that stuff is if we drill down into it or there's um, some mass wasting subsequently to volcanoes, especially ancient volcanoes that expose the interiors. That's when we get to see this stuff. It's not what comes out the top. And in many cases, what comes out the top and what is in the interior are two different things. Right? They're related, but they're really two quite different things. So oftentimes they're the complement of each other. Right? Um, and we'll talk about what that means chemically as we go on in the next uh, few lectures. So this is just kind of a summary of those three tectonic settings, right? The uh, constructive plate boundary, the mid-ocean ridge, we have the um, mantle rising um, up. Um, primarily being driven by the separation of the plates. And as it rises up and it decompresses, goes to low pressure, it starts to melt. The extraction of that melt transits through a magma chamber and we have some eruption in the proportion of stuff that gets to the surface versus to the interior is, like I say, something like a factor of, of six or one sixth erupts. And um, ocean island volcanoes such as here, the plate is moving by fixed source of magma that's coming out of the asthenosphere through a thicker bit of lithosphere, right? But especially in the ocean basins, the, as the plates separate and move along from their point of origin, they, can, they continue to thicken and cool. And so a hot spot in the location of Hawaii where the crust around us is, you know, um, in a Cretaceous age, it's gonna look different than a hot spot that's really close to the mid-ocean ridge where the that the sphere is thinner. Just the thermal conditions are going to be different. And the potential for contaminating magma as it transits through this um, kind of fixed part of the plate um, is also different. And then when we talk about continental volcanism, this is an example of a subduction zone where some components of the subducting plate are being drawn off 
in this um, heated process um, as we go up in pressure and up in temperature. We'll talk about the process more, but it comes off, fluxes into the mantle and causes the mantle to melt. But the way this cartoon is drawn is not very realistic. It makes it seem like most of the magma is coming right off the slab. That's not the case. Most of the magma is coming out of the asthenosphere or um, the lithospheric mantle, just like it is in these other cases. But you got some added spicy sauce that's coming in that helps uh, change the composition of these kinds of rocks to indicate things like water, water that had been bound up in the crust in alteration over its um, previous history, you know, found in clay minerals, for instance, and some of the materials that we find associated with sediments that have been kind of scraped off and added into the system. And even, even in that case, only a really small amount, we think, um, you know, less than a percent of what's here actually manages to get in here and affect the magmatic processes. But it's enough to make these kinds of magmas be much gassier, for instance, to erupt much more violently, to have different chemical compositions, just, just by changing a little bit the proportion of those things. So there's a whole bunch of rock names that I don't think you need to memorize. I don't think anyone ever needs to memorize names, but you do want to know where they come from. There's a um, thing called an IUG National Classification that people pretty much agree to use, even if the name of something changes when you change to a different language. Um, uh, you know, some, some of the names are the same, some of them are a little bit different, but they're always based on these kind of basic things, like the texture of the rock when you're looking at it in your hand, where you can tell if something was um, intrusive or extrusive, right, volcanic or plutonic. You can look at it and say, do I see a lot of crystals in that or not? Do I see a lot of vesicles, which are frozen gas bubbles, or not? Um, when I, when I look past all those big macroscopic phenomena and I look in with a hand lens at what we call the matrix, this, this stuff that's um, sort of last liquid to cool, what does it look like, right? Is it full of little crystals? Is it glassy? Um, does it have bubbles in it? What is the average size of the rock, of the grains in here? Uh, some compositional stuff, primarily how much silicon in the form of silicon dioxide, which is written out as silica, how much is there? And how much is there relative to phase diagrams, which can tell us that we're at saturation or not for specific kinds of minerals, like the mineral quartz. If quartz is part of the assemblage and we're at chemical equilibrium, we expect a certain amount of silicon in our, in our magma. We talked about the phthalate, um, quartz, iron, buffer previously um, when we were talking about core formation and the uh, um, uh, Kind of early, you know, proto uh, volcanism associated with that early crust is being one buffer that people use, um, and that was used to calculate something about the oxygen to gassy, but it also tells us something about the relative amount of silicon we expected on that. Uh, and then another thing that's commonly looked at are, are what they call TAS diagrams, which just stands for total alkalized versus silica. Total alkalized, it's not really total; it's basically a combination of the sodium and the potassium. Together. I don't know why that, that's ringing precariously. But um, there are other things, obviously, and we'll talk about some of the other things. But, but one of the things that this is interesting is, is it tells us about the degree of melting. We know the amount of variation in these things in the mantle isn't that great. Um, and so when these are very incompatible elements, as we've talked about previously, and we'll redefine again today, but the amount of these that we find in magmas is just kind of inversely correlated with the amount of melting that went on. Um, and these are just some pictures of some different kinds of igneous rocks that you can just see just looking at them. You can see differences in color, differences in texture. Um, it's a little bit hard to see vesicularity when these pictures are so small, but you can see things with flow banding, uh, things with lots of crystals in it, light colors, dark colors, more iron, less iron, oxidized iron or not. There's, there are a whole bunch of things beyond what are listed here that people use to classify these rocks. Now, we've also already talked about the crust, right? We make this crust, and Earth has this bimodal crustal distribution, which we talked about is from the two different densities of continental crust and um, oceanic crust, and that that's different from all the other stony planets, such as Venus, which has a single crustal distribution, single crustal type. 
this is a relationship of you know that distribution to chemistry, right? So this is just the amount of silicon, which is the dominant thing in most volcanic rocks on Earth. We have some weird types of volcanic rocks, things like carbonatites, which don't have very much silicon in them. And in fact, the rocks that the university sits on are also very silica undersaturated. Their silica is only about 38% in the lava flow of the campus is built. It's formed from a pretty unusual process that we'll talk about later, a very, very small degree partial melt. But most, most uh, igneous rocks on the planet sit between this range of about 40 and 80, with a couple of peaks, one peak right around 50%, a little bit higher, and one peak around 73% um, or so, right? With, with, you know, a fairly significant fraction in between. This is from a really early compendium that was produced in the early 20th century. So we have way more data now, although it's hard to find a, a graphic of it anywhere. Um, but this pattern hasn't really changed, right? And so these peaks are associated with that distribution. High density, low density, um, this being the lower, much lower density in the chain. Okay, and this just kind of describes um, something about this variation. So we know that when we melt certain assemblage of minerals at different conditions of pressure and temperature, what we're going to get. This can be reproduced in the lab, in melting experiments, it can be calculated. There's a huge literature from the literature of, of ceramics where people look at phase diagram development. And we understand that we don't really make these compositions over here by pulling melts off. It doesn't happen. What happens is we make magmas that start out here, but they contain enough special sauce that they have the propensity to differentiate into these compositions much more commonly than happens in the ocean basin, where they do differentiate, but not enough to get to these compositions, and they erupt this one instead. We also know that in continental settings, we get a lot of naked rock, right? It isn't oceans and continents. It's more like the oceans is pretty much this with a little bit of that, and the continents is pretty much this with a little bit of that mixed in. And the um, kind of boundary zones between them, where we have um, subduction zone volcanism, oftentimes erupt compositions that are kind of in between. That's why we have such a high, high value here, things like the andesites and to a lesser extent, the sites. So it's just as a kind of a teaser for what we're going to be talking about, um, there's the producing of magma in the mantle and there's the changes that happen as it transits up through the crust before it erupts. And a lot of that distribution of rock types is due to the lab, the things that happen after the melting takes place. Um, when people um, kind of write out the compositions of rocks, they usually view them as oxides. And there's 10 major elements that are usually reported for most rocks. And the reason they're produced, written out as oxides is kind of um, goes back to the way they were originally measured, right? Rocks were pulverized and heated in a furnace and oxidized to the greatest extent and then dissolved in various acids um, to kind of separate out one or another chemical element and then dry it in and weigh it out as an oxide. So we still today present most rock compositions as weight percent oxide, right? Doesn't mean that the original rock had that, like you'll see Na2O in tables. We don't have any Na2O in the rock. It's just the representation that harkens back to the early ways that these measurements were made. These measurements are now made primarily spectroscopically by comparing compositions um, measured, you know, using light of one or, or electromagnetic radiation anyway, of one or another wavelength and how it interacts with rocks, maybe x-rays, for instance, and comparing that to a standard. We look at responses, we look at how different minerals absorb and impact the signature, and then we can kind of deduce compositions from it. Um, but we still report it this old fashioned way. There are also, some minor elements. Um, minor elements can include things like manganese and water. Water is actually quite hard to measure. Um, lots of things can happen to a rock after the fact that perturb the water. Um, so people have to go through kind of extra special effort. But because of this, commonly we will see rocks where people measure everything that's in it and they add it up um, and get a sum, and the sum doesn't quite reach 100%. 
when we're talking about weight percent. And it's commonly thought that either it's because you made a bad measurement or something changed when you were doing your measurement, like accidentally oxidizing of your iron in the conditions of the, of the experiment and or loss of all four, right? Which are much more difficult to capture in this process. Um, and so, you know, for all the oxides except iron, when you look in the in tables of rocks, you will typically see just one chemical. One chemical, which you will sometimes see two things produced is iron. Some people will measure the iron oxidation state and then they will report both the iron two as FeO and the iron three as Fe2O3. Many times the people will um, measure the iron in a way that doesn't distinguish these two things. You can prepare the rock in reducing conditions so that however much of this and this you have, it all gets converted to that. And or you can produce a uh, process in a way that oxidizes all the iron to that. So you lose that information. But we have other chemicals that we can look at to tell us what we think the primary oxidation state was in the rock. But I'll just, you know, cutting to the chase, in the vast majority of volcanic rocks on the planet, this is the dominant form of iron. Because the mantle from which they came in is still chemically reduced. We can find some magmas that have a substantially higher proportion of iron three, but it's pretty rare, not, not um, impossible, but it's rare to find iron three being dominant relative to iron two. It's kind of harkens back to the last topic that we're talking about with the atmosphere. Most of the crustal rocks that we have initially formed in the mantle during uh, igneous processes, and they come to the surface with iron two, is that iron two, which subsequently gets oxidized to iron three, that is controlling the buildup of oxygen in the early atmosphere. So this is a diagram showing you compositional variation, again, in this um, early compendium of rocks from the early 20th century. These, this hasn't really changed. There, there was you know, several thousand rocks in here. And so you have to kind of look for yourself. Each element has a little uh, peak associated with it. And all but two of the elements shown here with these arrows have a single peak. They're unimodal. There's a certain composition they like to be in, right? And um, that composition <coughs> here is reflected as a percent of that oxide. So you can see where, you know, aluminum, it likes to be pretty high in the rock. It actually likes to be the second highest thing after silicon. Um, and uh, where some of these other elements tend to be lower. Magnesium starts out really high. It's, it's highest concentrations, uh, uh, excuse me, starts out low, saying it backward. Uh, at most of the distribution, like in continental rocks, is also magnesium. Even though in our rocks here in Hawaii, we have a lot of magnesium, they, that type of rock doesn't represent a major proportion of the rock types uh, on the planet. And so, you know, our magnesium concentration, which varies sort of here between like seven and 10 percent, they're not that common. You can see um, two of these, um, you know, calcium and potassium have two peaks. And part of these peaks, and part of these compositional distributions have to do with what minerals do these elements like to go into, right? Because certain rocks of certain bulk composition are made up of typical minerals, like the minerals that we typically find in a rock that you pick up here in Hawaii, a volcanic rock, going to be olivine, some pyroxene, some plagioclase and some iron oxide, right? That's that's what our rock is made of. And those minerals each hold a certain amount of certain elements and um, in various proportions. And so these kind of bimodal distributions for these two elements reflect the fact that they like to go into minerals that are formed, two, two different kind of categories of minerals. And so we find two different peaks of distribution for them. The, the kind of major element variations is really something that is discussed in petrology class. It's very complicated because it, it's not just a simple reflection of what was in the rock that was melted to make a magma and, and then it was modified and then it erupt, erupts with some composition. Um, it's a function of the pressure, temperature, stability of all the minerals that make up the rock is a function of all the conditions that it exists. Whereas the trace elements are a lot more simple because they don't make up the major mineralogical basis. So the trace elements, for the most part, you can find ex exceptions, but for the most part, just find themselves in a certain concentration 
you know, dissolved in the various minerals in the source rock. When melting happens, some of them go into that magma into greater or lesser extent. Some of them stay back to greater or lesser extent. And, um, and then as the magma migrates up to the surface, changes pressure, changes temperature, and then it starts to differentiate, the trace elements all partition themselves again as a function of the conditions. And so we use the trace elements to sort of see past some of this minerality. We still need to know what minerals are present um, and how our various elements behave, but we don't have to worry about um, you know, having enough of a particular phase to be able to stabilize that particular major element's presence or not. Because the trace elements, if they can't go into one mineral, if there's not there, they'll go into another, right? They, and they, they divide themselves up as, as per some rules, which we're gonna talk about next. There's some, also some names of um, igneous rocks across the top here. You've probably heard these terms before, especially if you've already had the, the igneous petroleum class. Mafic rocks are richer in iron and magnesium. They tend to be darker in color. They tend to be poorer in silicon, sort of more down around the 50% silicon um, um, to maybe not quite 60% when we get up here. And then silicic rocks, which are kind of the opposite, really high in silicon and not so high in iron and magnesium, tend to be lighter colored rocks. And again, these are very silicon rich. These are only sort of silicon rich. And what this diagram shows you is the percent by volume of different major minerals that are found in those rocks. Okay. And these are the things that control this, uh, these patterns. Because those minerals are made of these elements, the major elements. Trace elements, as I say, kind of see past that. But as you can imagine, if we're trying to model an igneous system, and for instance, we're talking about something that's silicic, we don't really have to worry about the mineral all of these because not to be present in that magma. It doesn't exist at that composition. We would be thinking about, you know, feldspars and quartz and, and um, amphiboles, for instance, um, for, for much of this diagram. And when we're up here in the make it compositions, we're worried about olivine and pyroxene and, um, and plagioclase instead. Um, so this is that that kind of you know final thing on the on the classification thing that I mentioned TAS colloidal silica. These are TAS diagrams. Okay, so this is the sum of the sodium plus potassium and plotted against the silicon content. And this is for volcanic rocks, extrusive rocks, and this is for plutonic rocks, intrusive rocks. And there are some differences in the major elements in the amount that we find in each case, in part because um, you know, of the phases that are present in, in plutonic rocks, the minerals that form and what they can and can't hold. Um, this space is divided up into a whole bunch of names, which again, I don't think you need to memorize, but there is this thing called the McDonald Katsura line, which is this kind of diagonal-ish space that cuts through here. This separates two fundamentally different zones on both diagrams. Um, alkalic compositions as per the name alkalis and not alkalic compositions, which on this diagram is called subalkalic, but in many cases it's called oleitic, right? Just like another term, um, but um, this is, has major implications for the conditions of melting. These elements are very, what we call incompatible. They don't like to stay in the solids in the mantle, when it's uh, melted, so when even when the very first stages of melt are produced, especially potassium, it likes to go into the melt, as we talked about last week when we talked about the potassium inventory on the earth and the relative amount that's still in the mantle versus now uh, in the crust. So it's a little bit less so, but as major elements go, they're pretty incompatible. And so when you think about melting in the mantle, if you melt it a lot, the things that are incompatible have gone into the melt and are not in the solid um, early on when we just first start melting and then additional melt just dilutes their concentration. Whereas things that are you know, compatible or only mildly incompatible will keep increasing in the melt as we add more melt to, to that system. So I, on this next two slides, I've taken a table and divided it in half, which is just a summary of some different kinds of, of igneous rocks. And so these are mafic rocks, uh, the iron rich ones. So you can, you can kind of see 
for instance, a typical um, olivine basalt with about half of the rock in the silicon dioxide. And the next biggest thing is that histogram plot I showed you before indicates this aluminum. The other elements kind of come down from there. This is the kind of total um, of, of all these things. Um, there's been a measurement of water. So you can see where that comes out in this particular rock. It's you know, something like a percent water in a couple of different chemical forms. Um, and that's a volcanic rock like this. It's got vesicles in it, it's got crystals in it. Um, it's not you know, a pure composition. You gotta grind up a big enough piece of it to take into account the variations. We also, and so we have different kinds of, of um, volcanic rocks here. And then there's also one um, intrusive or plutonic rock it says here, island are dunite. This, these are dunite inclusions, what we call xenoliths inside of a volcanic rock. So if we wanted to get the composition of this, and this is the lithology that forms um, uh, in a couple of different ways, but you know, one, one is by being heavily in the mantle and heavily stripped by melting processes, and it can be a residue, or it can be um, a crystal cumulate of a magma. Either way, it's got a lot of olivine and a lot of pyroxene and, and maybe a little bit of spinel and not much else. And um, one of the ways we get samples of it is it gets carried up in chunks within volcanic rocks. And so we call those xenoliths. So if we just look at the composition of this greenish part here, that's what this looks like. Um, you know, here, this island arc of dunite, you can see how much less um, silicon it has in it. And this is part of our understanding of as we extract melt from the mantle and we make rocks that erupt at the surface of the earth and or form intrusions, you have more silicon than the mantle it came from. And the mantle they leave behind has less silicon, right? Um, and, and there's a, a whole sort of proportion of all the other elements as per their propensities, which we'll talk about next. This is just a table of some silicic rocks. This again, an extrusive and an intrusive one, so you can sort of visually see the textual difference between a rock that's made up of a whole bunch of crystals, which is what a typical intrusive rock looks like. This is like the kind of stuff people make countertops out of um, versus you know, a volcanic rock of almost the same composition. And so again, you can see here that for instance, uh, a rhyolite like that one over there, 74% silica, much higher than the mafic rocks, but not every rock with a silicic composition has that high of a silica, right? So um, you have to think a little bit about the processes that go on to make it. And, and, it, and these terms are a little bit deceptive at times. So this is considered a silicic rock, even though it's got a very small amount of silica because of the mineral phases that, that are in it. And I don't, I don't really want to belabor the details of it, but the fact that it's a Nephalonite means it stabilizes the mineral nepheline, which again is like the lava flow that the university here sits on, formed by a very unusual process, not associated with the hot spot, some kind of very late stage, small degree melting that um, percolated and interacted with the lithosphere and then erupted at the surface with really un unusual compositions. So the next thing to think about is evolution of magma. Magnus form and then they change as a function of if the magma moves in pressure and temperature space, or even if it just sits somewhere and it starts to cool, it's going to evolve. And the way it evolves is by precipitating minerals. When those minerals come out, they're going to leave the remaining liquid with a new composition. These are something called Harker diagrams, which plot the percent of silicon and you can see an arrow here. This is what we call a liquid line of descent. It is a compositional variation that we can predict based on phase diagram. So if we have a specific, we pick a specific pressure and temperature, and then we model the trajectory, and then we can compare it to um, rocks that we might see um, you know, over a whole bunch of different eruption cycles in an individual volcano. When we see, for instance, magnesium goes down as silicon goes up. This is primarily due to the removal of mineral olivine plus minus the mineral orthopyroxene. And so you can see here, we get different slopes when that happens. Um, olivine, um, basically if the primary magma, something came off the mantle was here, we can find higher concentrations than we expect off the mantle, which we think must mean olivine was accumulated in that magma. 
high magnesium compositions at Mauna Loa have been explained this way, for instance. Uh, but then if the magma comes off the mountain and it sits in the crust and it starts to precipitate some all the minerals, the liquid is going to evolve down to the point where then pyroxene can come onto the liquid and start to also form. And you can see it changes your slope, right? And so when people model compositions, they want to understand, you know, the conditions of this differentiation, you might pull up a model. There are various programs that we use to model this, and you can change the pressure and temperature, and you can say, oh, okay, does the pressure temperature values that I use correspond with anything? Like that pressure look like where I think the magma chamber is, maybe detected by uh, seismic uh, information or what have you. Um, this shows you how the total alkalis, the stuff in the TAS diagram, how it varies. These things are more incompatible in these matrix minerals. So it doesn't really matter which mineral we have present. It's just going to keep increasing because when we pull mineral out of our liquid, what is left behind, what builds up in the liquid is the stuff that doesn't go into the liquid. Okay. Um, now these are what are called pseudo Harker diagrams over here. They're plotted against magnesium instead of silicon. These kinds of diagrams are useful in places where there's a lot of variation in silicon, right? Especially continental settings. But if you go to like a mid-ocean ridge or you come here to Hawaii, we don't have much variation in silicon, except for these methylonites in late stage. Pretty much all the rest of our rocks here in the islands are somewhere between about 49 and 51. This diagram is just not that useful um, because, because um, silicon doesn't change that much between um, mineral and melt over the degrees of differentiation that we have here. So instead, we use magnesium, which does vary a lot, especially as you can see here. And so, um, you know, magnesium variation starting high and going low is again, the um, continual removement, removal, excuse me, of magnesium rich phases. So you can see how potassium, calcium, and silicon vary as a function of magnesium. Again, potassium going up because it's incompatible, right? So as you take solids out, it doesn't go into those minerals. It just stays in the melt, so its concentration goes up. It's the opposite of dilution. It's like a concentration effect. Um, kind of like if you had sugar water and you started to freeze it, um, the ice crystals that form are not going to have much sugar in them, so the water that's left behind gets more and more sugary. Um, and there's an inflection here, again, associated with this phase change. Um, but in any event, that's how potassium varies. Calcium goes down. It goes down because it's compatible. Not so compatible in the olivine, but it is compatible in the pyroxene. So once when we have what we call pyroxene saturation, then it starts to come down. And this is um, how kind of, this is basically just the inverse of this plot, right? Just silicon. And if you recall, olivine is one of the kind of simplest minerals that we have in these matrix systems. It exists as a solid solution between an iron and the magnesium rich end member. We used this previously in the semester to do some um, temperature measurements for magmas. That's what we're working with number three. We have the spreadsheet and all that kind of stuff. So there's a composition of olivine that exists along the liquidus that has a different percentage of the two end members, the iron rich, excuse me, the magnesium rich and the iron rich end member. That is not exactly the same as the proportions in the melt, right? So um, the composition of the melt and the composition of the solid are calculated by kind of drawing these tie lines across. But the important thing to note is that as the magma changes in composition because of olivine removal, the olivine itself also changes. And we can track that using other trace elements that partition into the olivine differently as it changes its composition. Just like this, which for, for this part of the evolutionary curve is basically just olivine and then olivine plus pyroxene, right? It, it, the calcium not being particularly incompatible and all of a sudden um, being, being compatible and decreasing in concentration. Once feldspar comes on the liquidus as well, this curve gets even steeper. And we can track that, the difference between pyroxene and feldspar fractionation. We can do it with calcium, but sometimes that's difficult. Instead, we use other trace elements that go into those two minerals. Sometimes one goes into one of the minerals and not the other. But the different ratios of the elements is how they go in um, is something that we look at. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about the trace elements for um, the rest of the time, and we'll pick this up again next time uh, after Thanksgiving. Trace elements 
are by definition present in low concentration, um, generally less than a tenth of a weight percent. We have this category of elements we call the trace elements because they're trace elements in most magmas. Like you can sometimes go to a magma where a trace element is no longer trace because it's got an unusual composition. You go back to the rocks that are sitting underneath our feet, for instance. Um, but so by definition, normally something is trace of less than 0.1 weight percent. 0.1 weight percent is, is like one PPT, part per thousand. Oftentimes, trace elements are reported in PPMs, parts per million, or PPBs, parts per billion, right? We can even get lower than that. But we're talking about really small amounts of material. The amount is so low that they don't affect the energetics of the system. They don't affect the structure of minerals to a first order, to a second order, they kind of do. But, but this is the assumption that we use, is that the stuff that the rock is made of does not depend on the trace elements. They're just there kind of partitioning between the phases. And we use that to tell us something about the conditions that were extant when those phases were formed, like pressure, temperature, pace of formation, um, et cetera. So when we make a melt or when we crystallize from a melt, um, if we don't do that 100%, if we do it partial, so what we call partial melting, we take a solid and maybe melt 10% of it and leave some solid behind. Partial crystallization would be like have a liquid, maybe precipitate out five or 10% minerals. When we do that, all the trace elements re-align themselves between the melt and the solids as a function of their incompatibility. And their incompatibility is a function of these four things. How big are they? The ionic radius. How charged are they? The ionic charge. How electronegative they are, right? Just think about this big variation we have in electronegativity, um, and how um, the energy of the lattice mineral that they're going to go into is perturbed by these three things, right? So you got a mineral structure, right? They're relatively rigid, and you want to stick an element in there that's different than what that lattice is made from. And think back to when we talked about substitution in clays and cation exchange and all that kind of stuff. That was Clay minerals being sort of flat are easy to substitute stuff into, so we find relatively high amounts of substitution. But not everything substitutes into that mineral lattice. The element has to fit in the lattice, right? It has to be the right size to not tweak the lattice. It has to have about the right charge. If it has the wrong charge, it's going to destabilize it. If it's got a very different electronegativity than the element it's replacing, again, it's not going to be happy there. And so for elements to be compatible in a mineral, meaning they want to go into that mineral, we like to have some kind of ideal range of size, charge, and electronegativity for the mineral lattice site that it's going to go into. This is what trace element substitution really is. A trace element is going into a mineral instead of the thing that's supposed to be there. Some elements like to do it, some elements don't. Some elements don't like to do it in any minerals especially a really big thing like cesium and barium. Um, and um, some elements sometimes do it and sometimes don't do it, depending on what the mineral is. Like calcium, uh, so things like strontium will substitute it into, for calcium in the plasma place, but they won't substitute for magnesium into all of them, right? Even though in both cases, we're talking about three elements in this alkaline uh, earth series, right? This will substitute for this, but it won't substitute for that. This is primarily a size difference. It's just like too big of a size difference here for it to work. So we can do this kind of, you know, we can formalize this a little bit. And for instance, if someone named Goldschmidt, sometimes referred to as a father in geochemistry, uh, uh, um, we had a Goldschmidt conference here this summer that I was in charge of. Um, a, a very well known early geochemist that we've already talked about the. Atmophile, serophile, lithophile, and chalcophile elements. That was his classification of materials in the early Earth formation. Another thing he did was think about ionic substitution and why we find some minerals and uh, some elements in some minerals and not in others. And you know, this is useful for lots of stuff. One of them is sort of economic geology and finding ores and so forth. So his four rules, um, he basically started with three rules, and a fourth rule was added. But you know, um, basically. The size, uh, ions won't substitute for each other if their size differs, their radii differ by about 15%. Uh, they 
won't substitute for each other if they have a bigger charge difference than plus or minus one, right? Like a plus one ion might substitute for a plus two ion or vice versa, but a plus one ion won't substitute for a plus three ion or vice versa. Um, and then um, basically ionic potential, which we did we talked about before, right? This is the charge over the radius. It's more like the density of charge. So these kind of migrate together. That's part of, um, it's kind of part and parcel of these two. But something that was added later, not by Goldschmidt, was this idea of differences in electronegativity, right? And this comes to bear, especially in places like, so copper ions plus two ions, calcium plus two ions have it's almost the exact same radius and the same charge. But copper doesn't really substitute for calcium because this is a very electropositive element. And this is a pretty electronegative one. And so it's, it's too greedy. It wants too many electrons to be stable in the mineral lattice that it goes into compared to calcium. And so that's why this electronegativity rule has been added to explain some handful of those. And so we use what we call trace element partitioning to understand things like melting and crystallization, the speed of crystallization by looking at the diffusion of trace elements. And in material science, so this is just an example of, for instance, um, one perovskite structure mineral that's used in a solar cell is based on lead, lead's kind of toxic. So these, you know, people are like, eh, can we make the same chemical using strontium? And, and, you know, the preparation methods would be less toxic. And what's the energetics of that? And this is a, you know, a huge kind of industry, you know, with semiconductors and batteries and solar cells, ceramics, amongst other things. So, so, we're going to talk about melting and crystallization, but people use trace element partitioning and Goldschmidt's rules for all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> so this is a diagram showing you <clears throat> charge and radius and a contour map that comes from the book <clears throat> for, <clears throat> excuse me, substitution between clinopyroxene, a mineral, and a basaltic liquid, and the partition coefficients, which we've already defined, I'm going to come back and show it to you again, but it's basically the concentration in the solid divided by the concentration in the melt, okay? And um, you can see there's kind of a clustering here. So this is contoured for um, partition coefficient for um, two different categories of ions, plus two ions and um, plus um, uh, one ions. And um, what you basically see is a pattern emerging where some elements that are similar in size and charge to the major constituent ions substitute well into, so for instance, manganese, vanadium, cobalt, chromium, nickel, they substitute in for, to the spots that are occupied by iron and magnesium because they're similar to them. And when you look at all those elements, you'll see, yeah, they're close to them on the ferric chart, which means similar size, and the charge varies by you know none or only one unit. Whereas elements like tantalum and iodine, which have a really different charge, the very charged ions, they're not going to substitute in. They're way off to the side on the contour map. <clears throat> so in general, there's two kinds of incompatibility: incompatibility due to charge and incompatibility due to ionic radius. Those are the two main ones. Then we have this stuff with electronegativity and everything else. We call these elements. Large ion lithophiles, they like to go into the lithosphere because they're big, okay? We don't have very many elements that don't fit into things because they're too small, right? That is not common in many things. We call these kind of elements over here that are really charged, high field strength elements. They've got a lot of charge density around them. They don't like to go into mineral lattices or mineral lattices don't like to have them because they're too disruptive in terms of having a high charge on like a plus five. Uh, ion is just too much. So this is basically just an explanation of how size, charge, and electronegativity work. Um, and I'm not going to review it again. This is, uh, we've looked at this before, the distribution coefficient, which is the concentration of a chemical A in the solid divided by the melt. And when this is greater than one, the element is called compatible. When it's less than one, the element is called incompatible. So it likes to go here into the melt. And when we talk about a mixture of solids, meaning minerals in our case, and a magma, we have to calculate a bulk KD, sometimes written as a D, 
instead of the K. Sometimes the K, many people will reserve the K for an individual mineral melt partition, whereas the bulk D means I've summed up all the minerals and I've just made an average, a modal average, which is just a weighted average. Um, or sometimes they will write the K with a little line over. You see different notation. But hopefully, at least whatever text you're reading or paper, they will define what symbol they're using. If it says bulk, it means you're looking at a modal average across all the different minerals in the present. <clears throat> the element where the D is greater than one is compatible. An element where the D is less than one is incompatible. And an element where D is one is neutral, meaning it doesn't care one way or the other. Now, going to solid, going to liquid, doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> this is the formal definition. Distribution coefficient. These are the modal proportions, alpha, beta, gamma, up to however many minerals are present. Um, if it's 10% olivine and 20% pyroxene, you know, you'd have a 0.2, a 0.1 and a 0.2 here, times the individual mineral melt partition coefficient, which are things that are measured in labs. You know, it'll make just a specific mineral and they'll measure the distribution. And then, you know, you can pull these things out of table. So the bulk D is calculated from the individual minerals and their proportions that are present. And um, there's a more sophisticated model for this, which has to do with parameterizing minerals as a function of. Uh, and distribution into them as a function of the lattice mineral strain um, and the amount of energy an ion perturbs, um, you know, as it goes into that mineral, producing strain either by size or charge or electronegativity. And the original way of looking at that um, was something called an onuma diagram. So I'll just I'll end with them. I just want to show you them quickly. This is an example of an onuma diagram where you plot up. Uh, ionic radius and a partition coefficient. Some of them may be measured, some of them can be predicted by these things. And so this is a curve for all the um, plus three ions, and this is a separate curve for all the plus two ions going into, uh, in this particular case, in between olivine and silicate liquid. Right? So we know mag magnesium and iron, which olivine is based on, they have a high partition behavior, but all these other uh, plus two ions don't like going in. Same thing with these plus three ions. They like going in a little bit less, but and as their charge, or excuse me, the radius gets too big for the site, they really don't go in. These are orders of magnitude. Now, just to help illustrate this, I'll show you one more slide. These are partition um, diagram, anuma diagram into plagic place. This is a plagic place in a basalt, plagic place in a lilac. Each one of these curves is isoelectronic, right? Meaning it's the same charge. So this is the plus one charge, right? And there's a peak, and that peak, 1.18 angstroms, that's a size that is the sweet spot for putting stuff in the plagiarism place. We have it on both of these diagrams, but the concentration we find with different elements is different. See how this one here goes from 0.01 to 10, and this one goes from 0.1 to 100, right? So even, it's just the way they've been scaled. Strontium likes to fit into that spot, but it does so 10 times better in solicit compositions of magma than in matrix compositions of magma, right? And you can see how all of the kind of plus one and plus two ions kind of together cluster around that spot. They get higher and higher partition coefficients and more and more soluble in that mineral as um, the size approaches the sweet spot from either side. Now these other ions over here these are plus three ions, the rare earths. Um, they sit along this curve. They don't, they're, they really don't like going in, right? They're orders of magnitude less compatible. As we start to get to the smallest of the um, rare earths, actually, let me bring that back with the largest of the rare earths, um, it gets higher, right? We're we have a, a peak. And if there were elements that represented this on the other side of the curve, we might expect to see it go back down, but there aren't elements in this plus three category with its radius. So we'll pick this conversation up next time. I think the, the point about these diagrams is that by comparing a bunch of elements with the same charge together and seeing how they plot out, and, um, it helps us guide our thinking about the conditions that the minerals formed in and um, the kind of energetics of this formation. There's, there's next levels up to this where we can mathematically describe and predict. 
what we think partition coefficients are for particular compositions and so forth. Um, it gets rather sophisticated, but this is the basis of using trace elements for uh, you know, igneous, interrogating igneous processes. Sorry, I went a little bit long. Um, 